Okay, good morning um, everyone and welcome. Um, as it is now nine o'clock, um, I resume the hearings part of this examination of the York Local Plan. Um, first of all, can everyone hear me well enough? Very good, okay. Um, can I remind you please that if you do have a mobile phone or other electronic gadget with you, if you've brought a Nintendo or something like that, please make sure that it's switched off um, while the hearings are in session. Um, and if you haven't already done so, please make sure that you sign today's attendance sheet um, before you leave. Um, if there are any members of the press present, um, please can I ask that you sign the same sheet, but please do make it clear which media outlet, outlet you represent. Um, could I ask someone, someone from the council to remind us what we should do in the event of a fire or other emergency? Which way should we run? Hi. Um, yes, there's no schedule alarm practice during the ex examination hearings, but if the alarm goes off, ple please exit the hearing room by the main exit, go down the stairs and out of the main door of the Jim Crack building and make your way through the entrance building to the uh, RV point under the footbridge on the road outside the venue. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that. Um, now, the, the uh, council, as, as uh, yesterday, the council um, is video recording um, our proceedings, um, and there is a sheet for participants to sign, um, giving their agreement to that. Um, can I just check now that um, everyone has either already signed that sheet um, or is willing to do so and is happy for the uh, video recording to take place? Does that mean that everyone's happy? Okay, very good. Um, my name is uh, Simon Barclay, um, and to my right is my colleague um, Andrew McCormack. Uh, we're both planning inspectors and chartered town planners. We've been appointed by the Secretary of State to hold this examination into the soundness of the local plan and to produce a report of our conclusions and recommendations on the actions or changes needed in relation to soundness. Specifically, then, our role is to assess whether the plan satisfies the requirements of the 2004 Act, the relevant regulations relating to the preparation of the document, and whether it is sound. Um, in order to be sound, um, as though one could forget, the plan should be positively prepared, justified, effective, and consistent with national policy, as defined in the National Planning Policy Framework, the NPPF. Um, Carol Crooks is our programme officer. Um, She's standing by the door over there if you haven't met her before. Um, she's an independent officer of the examination, working under our guidance, undertaking the administration of the examination, and in effect, she acts as a conduit for communication um, between us um, and uh, everyone else participating in the examination. She generally works um, very hard to make sure that the examination runs as smoothly as it possibly can. Um, so if you do have anything to raise with us um, outside of the hearing session, then please do um, go to uh, Mrs. Crooks. A few things um, just to make sure that everyone's um, clear about, and this really is for the benefit of people that weren't um, here yesterday. I did mention just now the um, NPPF. Um, just to be absolutely clear, um, this examination is proceeding um, on the basis of the transitional arrangements, um, which in effect mean that it's the policies of the 2012 NPPF that apply um, rather than the 2019 NPPF. So we will assume, if you say national policy or NPPF um, during the discussion, we'll assume, unless you say otherwise, that you're referring to the 2012 NPPF. Um, yeah, we're, we're, what we're examining here um, is the local plan as it was originally submitted. Um, that's the document that we're testing in terms of legal compliance um, and soundness. And the council, um, as you will doubtlessly know, um, has put forward um, a number um, of modifications, um, and they were consulted on um, earlier this year in June and July alongside um, additional work that the council um, had, has also undertaken. So, for the avoidance of doubt, um, those modifications, um, presently um, at least, are not endorsed or supported by us um, in any way. Those are modifications that the Council has put forward. So the starting point then is the plan um, as it was originally submitted. Uh, any further um, changes proposed um, by the authority, um, or indeed um, anyone else, um, should only, only be advanced if necessary to make the plan sound. The council is free to make um, minor changes um, as it sees fit, um, so we, we don't need to um, focus on those at all, and our examination will focus purely on the question of soundness. Just one or two things um, about the hearing sessions. This is uh, phase one um, of the hearings. 
um, and following phase, uh, these phase one hearings, if we consider that the plan is legally compliant and that there is a reasonable chance that it could be found sound um, in relation to the phase one matters, um, then the hearings will then move on to um, phase two. Um, and it's likely, although not certain, but likely that phase two hearings would cover um, everything else um, not discussed under phase one, um, but we will need to see um, how things go. Yeah, sites, um, to be absolutely clear, I know that um, there are some of you um, around the table who have a particular penchant for one site or another. Um, we're not focusing um, on sites under the, uh, under the phase one hearings um, at all. Um, this is quite a strategic discussion, so please don't try and drag us um, down the site-specific um, avenue. Um, and a heads up um, for the future, um, really, when we do, under phase two, um, come to talking um, about sites, um, we will be focusing um, on the sites that are proposed in the plan rather, th rather than sites that are not proposed in the plan. So we won't be um, considering in the first instance at least um, emission sites. And the reason for that um, is because we are tasked with, um, with coming to conclusions about the soundness of the plan that's before us um, and not sites that are not. Um, our guidance note outlines the procedures to be followed at the hearing sessions, um, the way in which written uh, representations will be dealt with and the availability of um, information. Uh, as before, um, today's hearing session will take the form of a stru structured discussion um, which we shall lead um, and we will be following the matters and issues paper um, that's already been circulated. Um, we haven't produced any separate agendas um, or anything like that because Frankly, I like to try and keep things as simple um, as they possibly can be. Um, as the hearing session goes along, um, we will invite people to speak at particular times, but if you do have anything to contribute and you're sitting there desperately trying to get in on the discussion, um, please do um, indicate by upending your nameplate um, and we'll bring you into the debate at a, an appropriate point. Um, <clears throat> yeah, in terms of the programme then um, for the phase one hearing sessions, um, yeah. Um, it's my deepest desire um, that we complete um, the phase one hearing sessions um, by the close of play on Wednesday um, the 18th and most people around the table, in fact I think everyone around the table yesterday agreed that that um, is a realistic prospect. Um, are there any dissenters today? Very good. Um, in which case we shall take that as an aim. Um, and to help focus minds, though, um, we do have a reserve day on Thursday scheduled. So if the debate does overrun um, on any of the scheduled days, please do be prepared um, to attend on that Thursday. Uh, yes, as I mentioned yesterday, um, there's a chance that the more observant amongst us might have noticed that there's a general election um, on at present, um, and there may uh, be um, some of you here who are politically minded or indeed politicians of some sort. Um, and I'm sure we don't need to remind you, but um, if you do fall into that category, um, this is not the place for making political points um, or giving party political broadcasts. Um, there is no place for electioneering here. Um, yeah. Today we will take a short mid-morning break um, and one again around mid-afternoon time um, with you never know your luck, a slightly more luxurious break for lunch. Um, I ought to say um, that there are, we're lucky enough um, to have some people um, from the planning inspectorate um, here today um, and they're here purely for the undoubted pleasure of um, observing our proceedings. Um, they won't play any part um, in the debate at all, and nor will they have any role or influence um, in the conclusions um, we reach. Um, and I ought to say that um, if you do um, see either of us um, talk, talking um, to, those, to those people during the adjournments, um, you can rest assured that we're, we're talking about office politics or something like that. Um, who's been pilfering the biscuits from the uh, office kitchen, um, rather than, um, rather than any, anything about, uh, about the evidence before us. Um, again, as yesterday, I also, in the interests of openness and transparency, ought to um, mention that there are a few faces around the table that are familiar to one or the other of us. Um, those are people that we have met, by and large, um, at um, examination events just like this one, or that we know um, from a previous life. The point being here that um, that does not affect our impartiality one way um, or indeed 
the other. Um, I think that's enough, frankly, um, from us. Um, if I could um, again have introductions um, around the table, starting on the council side. Uh, so, as, as you know from yesterday, uh, my name is David Elvin, Queen's Council. I'm instructed on behalf of the City Council with my learned friend Mr. Scott Linus, who sits behind. Uh, today, uh, you've got Sorry, Rachel Maysfield uh, from the Council, Justin Gardner and Paul McCogan from GL Hearn, who will be uh, leading from our side on the, uh, on the housing issues and there's other support behind who I won't introduce. Can I just say, before we go any further, can I apologise for the delay yesterday in getting matters up onto the website? We have, the, uh, the local plan team have uh, been putting them on immediately, but it's the, uh, the, the web team at, at York City Council who've been delayed. Mr Slater has spoken to them this morning and it's, matters will go up immediately rather than the delay we had yesterday. And can, can, I, I, can I just check, is that the um, statement of common ground with well, Highways England and the it, Oxford yes. econometrics well, work? I was just about to say the Oxford report is now EXCYC29 and Mr uh, Slater <laughs> showed me it is on the website now. But can I apologise for the delay yesterday? I hope we've fixed it. Uh, is, is that delay likely to cause any problem? We did hand out some paper copies yesterday, so hopefully. And there are more paper copies here if anybody needs them. OK, thank you. Um, we'll, we'll frankly wait and see if it does cause a problem. We'll, we'll see how we go. Um, Craig Barnes Gladman. Andrew Pyatt for uh, Gateway to York. Morning everyone, Paul Butler, TW Fields, Sites ST7, ST14. Sorry, could I ask Mr. Butler? Um, I can't. Uh, I'm in danger of nearly being able to see the nameplates today, um, now, now that um, Mrs. Crooks has made up new ones um, with, with, with um, much bolder text, um, but not quite. Um, so if I could ask everyone to, to do what they can um, to uh, face their nameplates towards me, then I, I might just stand a fighting chance. But um, if I do get it wrong, please, A, forgive me, um, and B, feel free to correct me if I get your name wrong. Yes, good morning. I'm David Carr. I'm the uh, Ward Councillor, City of York Councillor for Cotmanthorpe Ward and a Parish Councillor for Cotmanthorpe Parish Council. Ray Calpin, York resident. Morning, sir. I'm hot desking with Mr. Robin Miller, who's sitting uh, behind me for, at, the, at the moment from Understanding Data. Uh, and uh, I'm Mary Cook, Town Legal, and we're both representing Langwith Development Partnership. Good morning, sir. It's Colin Robinson from Litchfields, and I'm here representing Telewimp UK Limited, Persimmon Homes, and Bellway Homes. Justin Gartland, also of Litchfield, representing the same clients. Good morning, sirs. My name is Cameron Austin Fell from RPS, and I'm here today on behalf of the Defence Infrastructure Organisation. Morning, sir. Mark Johnson, Johnson Mallet, representing Red Row on ST8 and Taylor Wimpy on ST7. And on that note, sir, uh, Taylor Wimpy have got Litchfields covering this morning's session. Red Row haven't put specific OAN data in, and on that basis, I'll return to this table on distribution, but I'll not waste any further time this morning on the numbers. Thank you. Good morning, Cass Catherine Dukes from Directions Planning Consultancy, uh, Representative Joseph Roundtree, Housing Trust, William Birch, Northminster Limited, um, private clients, Mr and Mrs Sunderland and Ask and Bryan College. Mark Lane, DPP, representing Linden Homes and the Shepherd Group. Good morning, Stuart Natkus from Bath and Wilmot on behalf of Baron David Wilson Homes. Ricardo Gomez, uh, Hatch, representing Barwood. Matthew Good, Pegasus Group, representing Lovell Developments. Uh, Joanne Harding from the Home Builders Federation. Good morning, sir. Anthony Pollard from Turley, representing LNQ Estates, formerly Gallagher Estates. Good morning, Steve Secker, representing the York and North Yorkshire Chamber of Commerce. Morning, sir. Uh, Eamon Keogh, O'Neill Associates, representing uh, Goldtrace Garden Village Development Company. 
Richard Clark, uh, York Constituency Labour Party. Councillor Michael Pavlovic, representing the York Labour Group. Simon Grundy, Carter Jonas, representing Carbon Homes, a registered provider. Michael Corsier, local resident, representing Fulford and Hessington Parish Councils. Good morning, sirs. Peter Canavan, Carter Jonas, representing the Banks Group. Hello, Laura Fern from Ed and Planning Consultants, representing Miska Harrison, resident of York. Uh, thank, okay, thank you um, all, and welcome to what will no doubt prove to be, following yesterday, the second best day out at the races um, you will ever experience. Um, are there any um, questions about procedure or anything like that before we get into um, the, the, the crux of today? Okay, very good, thank you. In which case then, um, let us turn to uh, matter to the housing strategy um, and the question of the objectively assessed housing need. So we're looking um, on the matters and issues paper at questions 2.2, 2.3 and 2.4. Um, what I plan to do um, is this, um, I'm going to take question 2.2 um, first of all um, and I think that that can be dealt with um, relatively quickly um, because that largely was about um, us establishing um, one or two um, facts. I'm then going to take I think questions um, 2.3 uh, 2 and 2.4 um, together um, and, but first of all, to clarify, before I do that, um, I'm going to go through um, my understanding um, of where things are um, with the OAN um, and just to make sure that I, frankly, get that right. Um, I will say, um, I am slightly troubled and it, about something that um, we, we talked about um, yesterday, um, and that was the, if I, if I can call it, the mixing and matching question. Um, and that is whether or not um, applying um, one approach to identifying OAN in York um, causes problems when Selby um, is using, in, within the same HMA, um, is using a different method. And then we touched on it um, yesterday, but that's something that um, I want to explore uh, in a bit more detail today. So if I could ask, I, I suspect this, is, this will be for Mr. McColgan um, from the council's side um, to deal with that. But I thought I'd give you a heads up so that you have a chance at least to kind of think about that and, and how that might play into um, the discussion. So question 2.2 then. <clears throat> yeah, policy SS1 and paragraph 3.3 of the plan um, say that the um, objectively assessed housing need, I, I try to keep away from acronyms, but um, I can't keep saying objectively assessed housing need all day, um, so I will say OAN and hope that you will forgive me for that, um, is um, 867 um, dwellings per annum um, in the plan area for the plan period, um, which I think is 27 to 2033. Um, however, since the submission of the plan, the council has put forward further evidence um, to indicate that the OAN is now considered to be 790 dwellings per annum. Under question A, um, I'm simply asking um, about whether, you know, where those figures come from and I think in short, apart from the bit at the end that is about is this a robust evidential basis which we'll put, put aside for now, um, the answer is yes, isn't it? Yes. Good. Um, is anyone here to say that the answer to that is no? Marvellous, that's a good start. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Not, sorry. Not such a good start. Sorry, sir. Have you just answered the question? Sorry, are we okay to speak? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, is it Mr. It, Clark? Yes, it is. Thank you. Uh, the, you haven't just answered it, the question, is this a robust evidential no. basis? No, okay. no. I've, I've, Thank <laughs> you. No, no, no. no, no. I quite, I quite thanks, specifically... Thanks, I thought we were in big trouble I quite there. specifically <laughs> said, I'll, I'll put that aside for now. When, when it, well, what I'm going to do is pick up that, that element of that question um, under the, the 
following two questions. Um, because it's my I fault. Can, frankly, it means I think that I can get through 2.2 very, very quickly. Uh, yeah. yeah, okay, thank you. Um, <coughs> so part B um, then of um, question 2.2 is, does the 13,152 total housing figure identified um, at the year 2032-33 in the Schla include meeting housing needs arising in parts of adjoining districts? I think the answer to that is no. Anyone here to say I've got that wrong? Marvellous. Uh, yeah, one question. I, I, I thought that I heard from the council um, yesterday a figure of 20,000 um, during the council's opening. Just want to make sure that I've got my numbers right. Yes. Uh, yes, I, I, I see from his statement that he may have said that. Um, the position is as the evidence is presented. If it's inconsistent with that figure, please disregard the 20,000. Okay, okay, so for pr present purposes then I should be um, looking at the 13,152. Okay, thank you um, very much. Um, anything else to be said under 2.2b? You look tempted then, Mr. Corsi, I know. Sir, I was going to ask a question at the end of 2.2. Uh, two, two. When are we going to deal with in the inherited shortfall, which the council are now planning to add as a proposed modification to the policy? My, SS I'm really sorry. E even though you're only sat there, I, I didn't catch that. I'll speak up, sir. Uh, yes, it's, I am, it's, I am, it's my fault. <laughs> I'm wondering, sir, when are we going to deal with the inherited shortfall question? Uh, we deal with it under 2.2, but uh, Council deals with it under the housing requirement. You'll have noticed when you read the Council's submissions on the matter too, they are planning to add an additional 32 dwellings to the policy per annum to the um, policy SS1 requirement. And so clearly that logically falls part of the OAN, not the actual requirement itself. So I'm just asking a question, when, when do you want to deal with that? Yeah, I don't want to do, deal with it under 2.2. Um, I think you can either bring that out um, under um, 2.3 um, or then under the, the, the housing requirement. Sir, it clearly is an OAM point, not a housing requirement point. That, that's why I say you could deal with it under 2.3. Anything else under 2.2b? Okay, um, C then. Um, this is something we touched on um, yesterday, but I think it, um, you know, not, not everyone was here yesterday, so I think um, we, we do need to revisit this. Um, and the question is, um, do the adjoining um, local planning authorities accept the initial OEN of 867, um, or do they indeed accept the revised OAN of uh, 790? Um, and if so, are they basing their housing need in the context of that OAN figure? Okay, thank you. Um, no authorities have challenged the calculation or requested that York um, meet their need. Um, that was confirmed through the duty to cooperate um, conversations through the um, representations to the original Reg 19 consultation and the proposed modifications consultation and also in the statement of common ground with the neighbouring authorities um, that's on the examination library. <coughs> so that's to say then, is it that they haven't challenged the 867 figure. They also haven't challenged the 790 figure. Um, <clears throat> would I be right in thinking then that um, they don't care what the figure is as long as you are meeting your own need? <clears throat> uh, yes, 
that is correct in the sense that they have both not challenged the 867 figure or the 790. The discussions through the duty to cooperate have been that it should be for York to meet its own need within its own authority boundary and likewise with the other authorities or the neighbouring authorities are seeking to meet their objectively assessed needs within their boundary. Um, yeah, this plays into the mixing and matching um, issue, doesn't it, I think. Um, the second part of the question then is um, whether um, adjoining authorities um, are basing their housing need in the context of um, York's OAN figure. The neighbouring authorities' plans are at various stages. Some have obviously got adopted plans. Some have been through examination recently, like Harrogate, and obviously Selby have made the decision to progress with a new local plan. But through the duty to cooperate, we've had discussions regarding York's objectively assessed need, and um, the authorities um, have agreed that York should meet its own need within its own areas, and none have raised any um, issues regarding an unmet need for York to meet for to York, for York to meet from their area or likewise um, for, the, for those authorities to meet any of York's unmet need. Okay, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave that there for now, but I do want to come back to, as I, as I mentioned earlier, the, the mixing and matching um, point later on. Um, is there anyone else here to um, comment on 2.2c? No? Thank you. Um, in which case, then, as I said earlier, um, I'm going to take um, questions 2.3 and 2.4 together. Um, but first of all, um, I want to just run, th run briefly through um, what we might call my summary of what I think you've done um, to arrive at the OAN. And I'm going to look to the Council in the first instance um, to um, check that I've, I've got this right as I go through. I mean, what I was going to ask in due course when it's convenient is to get Mr Gardner to run you through the latest update, which is uh, CYC 9, which is the um, January 2019 update, and just set out the stages in the current assessment so you have it clear. In, in, in effect, what I'm going to do, Mr. Elvin, um, is um, uh, yes, give you my version of what I think that very document um, does, um, just just as a brief sort of overview, just to check that my general understanding is right. What I'm then going to do um, is go back to the beginning um, and take each stage at a time in in detail. So just to make sure that I've got it right, generally speaking, first of all, um, and, then make, and then look at the, the, the detail and see why the various assumptions were made and, and, and whatever. So does that, do you follow? Yeah, okay, good. Um, so I'm looking then at the, um, the OAN um, update prepared by um, GL Hearn, um, and that's um, of January 2019, because that, that's the, the, the council's latest. That, that is, in short, the evidence that the council relies on, isn't it, now, for, for, for the OAN. So what I think you've done um, <laughs> is you've looked at the 2016 household projections and the various criticisms um, that have been made of those projections and thought that it might be better in the circumstances to use the 2016 population projections um, because previously you say um, the household formation rates um, used to in the 2014 based um, projections um, look back to 1971 um, but the 2016 household projections only look at household formation from 2001 um, and you say that that has locked in deterioration in affordability Am I so far so good? And this is, this is a, a summary. I'm not going into detail now. A very, um, I think locked, certainly locked in the deterioration of the formation of younger households on the household projections. I think the other thing which you did sort of touch on, the projections are made up of two elements, which is a population projection and then the household 
the converting of the population projection into a household projection. In terms of this work, um, we're, we're content that the, that the population side of it is, is robust, sound, based on reasonable evidence, links sensibly with the latest national position on population projections. And so it was, it was the household, the converting of population to households. That was, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to come on to that. Um, I'm, I'm okay. going to take it. Um, I'm just going to go through the stages briefly, and I'm just looking really for a yes or no confirmation of whether I've got it right. If, it, if it's yes, all you, well and good. If I've got it wrong, then obviously tell me why. No, you've got it right that yes, that we've that we've um, built in some some of the older household projection data to to yeah to so as to not have that deterioration of household formation. So can I take that as a yes? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Good. Um, you think um, that the 2016 population um, projections are robust, um, and one of the reasons I think that you give for that is that they are ratified by um, the more recent mid-year estimates. I don't know if everyone heard that, oh, sorry. Um, yes, but, but Mr. Mr. Yes. Mr. Gartner um, confirmed that I was right. You um, then um, have the question um, of how you get from population um, figures to household figures, um, and you examine um, three scenarios, which um, I think are at paragraphs 2.24, and again uh, in, in a table at paragraph 2.29 um, of, of the update. Have I got that right? You look at three different scenarios. Uh, three different scenarios for, for household formation, yes. Um, you then, I'll, I'll come back, because I know this is, this is the demographically derived figure, which I'll, I'll come back to in a moment. Um, but you then considered um, the housing, the, the amount of housing needed to cater for um, economic growth. Um, and that is um, because policy SS1 aims to provide 650 um, jobs per annum. That's correct. Just while I'm on that point, can I just double check that the 650 jobs per annum, is that a net figure? Yeah. Yes, it is. OK, thank you. Um, and um, that's an exercise it seems to me that um, requires numerous assumptions um, and you have used um, economic activity rates from the um, Office of Budget Responsibility, um, OBR, that's another acronym I will permit um, as the discussion goes on, um, with an adjustment for household formation rates um, and all of that brings you to 790 dwellings per annum. Um, have I got that right? That is correct, yes. Table 10. And then overall and in short, um, you say that that 790 figure arrived at, um, and to put it simply, is bigger than the demographically derived um, uh, figure, even when a 15% uplift is applied to the demographically derived figure for affordability. Um, I think the before the 15% added, the demographic figure is 484, um, but once the 15% is added, um, that brings you to 557. You say 790 is bigger than 557, and therefore, in order to cater for the jobs to be created, the most appropriate um, OAN um, for this plan is um, the economically derived figure of 790. Have I got that right? That is correct, yes. Gold star for me, then. Good. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad about that. Um, what I want to do um, now um, is, I think, take um, the questions at 2.3. Well, no, I think what, I, what I'd like you to do, I'm not sure if this is for you, Mr. Gardner, or for, for Mr. McColgan, um, I, I, I don't mind which. Um, if you wouldn't mind, um, metaphorically at least, taking me by the hand um, and leading me through um, the OAN work um, one step at a time um, so that I can ask um, questions about why you've, um, well, frankly, why um, at each stage um, and others can come in because I know other people have different.
different, there are different views around the table, aren't there, even, even from the starting point? OK, um, well, I'll deal with that then. Um, still within EXCYC9. Should we just work through and then stop at appropriate points when you want to ask? Um, well, I suppose the, the premise of this report, January 2019, uh, recognition that the City of York plan, as you know, is being developed under transition arrangements, meaning we're still linking back to the 2012 MPPF and the relevant planning practice guidance. Uh, the latest version, I believe, was March 2015. I don't think it was updated beyond then. And the recognition that that planning practice guidance is quite clear that, that any assessment of need should take account of the latest available evidence. Um, in terms of this report, the latest available evidence in particular was a new set of population and household projections that had a 2016 base. Apologies, did you say the household, which household figure? Did you say the household projections? The, the, yeah, the, well, the, one of the drivers for this piece of work was recognition of a new set of both population and household projections that had a 2016 base. So you say um, the PPG says you need to use um, the most up-to-date evidence, um, and the most up-to-date evidence were the population and household projections that are 2016 based, yeah? That's right. Yes. Uh, it's, uh, so the most up-to-date evidence, 2A016, is your reference for that. Um, am I right in thinking that the PPG actually says that it's the household projections that are the starting point? The starting point, yes, that's correct. Uh, in terms of, but in terms of looking at OAN, you, I think you need to understand the two components that make up those household projections. But yes, um, and in terms of that starting point, um, the PPG is quite clear. The starting point is those projections, and that actually is the 484 figure that you that you noted. So that is just those projections as published before taking any account of any issues, for example, around the suppression of household formation. Is that quite right, though? Um, the PPG, as I have it, says, um, what is the starting point to establish the need for housing? Household projections published by the Department for Communities and Local Government should provide the starting point estimate of overall housing need. Um, the household projections are produced by applying projected household representative rates to the population projections uh, published by the ONS, etc. So you're, you have uh, arrived at household projections, but those are slightly different, aren't they, um, to the household projections? I know they're not published by um, government anymore, they're published by the ONS, um, but that, that's a slightly different thing, isn't it? What, the, the, that it's shifted from being CLG to ONS, or...? No, well, I, I think that you were trying to tell me that you did use the household projections as the starting point. Yes. But I don't think you did, because you used the population projections as the starting point and then, prov and then, and then used different household formation rates to those used by ONS. No, in terms of the starting point, it's the household projections as published. Um, we're looking... I think with the starting point, you're looking at 2A01015. In terms of what the guidance is saying, is it says that, that whilst that's your starting point, you do need to look at those and reflect whether actually it actually says the household projection-based estimate may require adjustment to reflect factors affecting local demography and household formation rates, which may not be captured in past trends. So the starting point is the projections as published. That's the 484 figure. But yes, as part of our work, we've recognised that those 2016, those latest projections, appear to be building in some degree of suppression, and that's why there is an adjustment made, which gets you to that demographic need figure of, from memory, six, seven, nine dwellings per annum, something around that mark. Yes. So, so no, the start, no, the starting point is very much it is those projections as published, and then if you if you read on through the guidance, fourth paragraph under. 2A015 is saying, look, here's a, here's a possible issue, and, and it was an issue within those projections, and it's something we've, we've sought to deal with. 
Um, ju just um, for absolute clarity, c can I ask um, that when people are using the word projections, um, they're clear about whether they mean the household or, or, or the population um, projections for the avoidance of, of any doubt? Will do. <laughs> okay, I take your point. Um, uh, Mr. Pollard. Thank you, sir. I think it's probably just worth taking a very quick step back. I just I wouldn't want in your mind um, a view or conclusion that there's an absolute necessity to take these projections into account. I think we have to frame the transitional arrangements in the context that the government was trying to seek in terms of accelerating the process of plan making, quickening up, um, you know, avoiding delays and uncertainty. Now, obviously, we are a number of months now past the transitional arrangements. Equally, the guidance, as Mr Gardner has already outlined, was written well in advance of the 2016 projections being published. The government has obviously identified a number of concerns with those. In some ways, you could have said that's why they've changed, you know, put the transitional method in place. And I think if I was going to stay just to a couple of paragraphs on that, our appendix to our hearing statement, paragraphs 3.5 to 3.7, kind of takes those steps through and also highlights when the government was releasing its new approach and the transitional method. There was a, um, a note published by the planning director of MHCLG which did reaffirm that plans submitted on or before 24th of January can be based on existing assessments of housing need. It would be interesting to have seen whether the council would have been quite so keen to take account of the new projections if they'd suggested a higher need for argument's sake. So I think, I think just as a framing context, I would make the point that we don't, it's not a necessity um, to take these into account based on the, current, on the guidance being considered. So on that then, Mr Pollard, um, do you say that the plan is unsound because the council um, has sought to um, base its OAN on more recent figures? I think as per our hearing statement, the point would be that they've um, taken every opportunity through the process to um, question the figures where it's in their favour and the numbers go down. I think I would refer back to quite a lot of evidence which has suggested the figure um, was at a more reasonable level previously. And I think the, qu the point we're raising through the hearing statement is just the level of scrutiny and testing of the changing circumstances, the meaningful change in overall circumstances, which leads to such a dramatic reduction, particularly on the numbers you've just identified there in terms of the demographic starting point, and overall the level of need which has now um, been discussed versus earlier versions of the plan and evidence that the Council has published. Do apologise. I'm struggling reading names, particularly when they're on their side. Um, is it Mr. Austin Fell? Uh, it is, yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> you. You've picked that out quite well from this distance. Um, I just thought I'd come in on this one while we're still talking in, in broad measures. We're not getting into the details of, uh, of, of how the different uh, components or ingredients come forward. Um, but just picking up on process and, and Mr Pollard's point here, um, the Council were very aware at the time of, of publishing this update that it was very much in the government's interest to avoid delays to plan making. And they made that very clear in their October 2018 consultation on what to do with the new projections. Now, the council will no doubt sort of bring to my attention that this was related to the approach for the standard method, though there are a degree of similarities here that should have been borne in mind. Um, Paragraph 26 of that document, for example, notes that the 2016 projections had led to a significant change across the country um, in, compa in comparison with the 2014 baseline, and to use them would cause delays to the plan-making process that would be an unacceptable consequence. Now, clearly this is in the context of the standard method, though there are similarities here that I think should have been borne in mind um, before embarking on the process of updating the plan when, in fact, they had um, a sounder basis for a starting point in the 2014 projections. Um, now, I don't want to take you through sort of a, a chapter in verse, but as part of our supporting statement, we've detailed a chronology of um, how this matter has been dealt with through transitional plans elsewhere. And we've seen through a number of, of, of cases, perhaps uh, Kirklees back in January 2019, 
Rugby, March 2019, Guildford, March 2019, Nuneaton and Bedworth in April uh, 2019, and, and more recently Wickham in, in, in July 2019, that this matter has, has caused considerable frustration to the process when, um, when in reality it was the government's intention to make things as simple as possible. Now that simplicity will hopefully translate through when we, we move to the standard method, as I'm sure a lot of people will be happy to see in the coming months. But it, I think it harks back to the, the, the purposes of what should have been done in the first place. Uh, and unfortunately, we're left with a position where a simple matter has become a very complex one. Thank you. Hmm. Um, I, I'm wondering, um, Mr. Austin felt what to make of that in terms of soundness. Um, are, are, are you saying that well, I don't quite know what you're saying. Um, is, is it because the council um, ha has taken its time and, and, and looked um, at more recent population and or household projections um, that it's delayed its plan making and what? That I, I should therefore now find ton sound? So I think me out? I, I th <laughs> we are where we are with the delays. Unfortunately, um, um, the work has been done um, and it's, it's there for us to take into account. But what we can see through these chronology of, of other decisions from uh, colleagues in the planning inspectorate, that these, um, that these projections have not been welcomed as part of the transitional arrangements. Um, and drawing similarities here, we, we, we note that um, in terms of the population growth, um, there's been a 40% reduction from the 2014 to the 2016 projections. I'm not going to stray much into further detail on that one until the next bit, but that is marked as a significant change. And um, coming back to um, the, the, the latest um, uh, local plan decision I've just referred to, Wickham, in July 2019, there was remarked a 40% reduction in the projections. And in that instance, it wasn't even entertained that they were con to be considered and to ensure there was stability as, as far as the starting point is concerned, um, they were disregarded from the outset. Now, so turning to soundness, you know, we will go through the appropriateness of those projections uh, because they are before us to have a look at. But it is our, um, it is our request that we would go back to um, SD050 as the starting point for us to, to look at as a sound basis. Sorry, SD050, you said. Thank you, sir. I think that's the, the Schmar update from 2017. Mr. Natkus. Thank you, sir. Most people get my name wrong when they can read it, so you've done exceptionally well there. Um, it, was, it was just a quick point on, um, on where we are with the, the projections of effectively you've, you've highlighted its change from being demographic-led to being economic-led, and the Council have touched on a phrase that appears in their response to this, which is that the 2016 to 2014 base figures were a meaningful change, and we are going to come on to that and we'll talk about it. But they said because of that meaningful change, almost duty bound to look at it, and that has then resulted in consideration of an economic led housing need. However, that meaningful change doesn't then appear to have moved through to looking at the most up to date evidence on the economic data which was only presented last night. And I know we will come on to this, but it was just to flag very early when they're saying we should look at this for meaningful change. They should then look at all of the evidence that may have had meaningful change. And it's inappropriate to jump from 2014 to 2016 household projections, but then rely upon employment data that's four or five years out of date when you end up then having an employment-led figure. That should have all been updated way before last night when the new information was available. Mr. Robinson. Thank you, sir. Um, I mean, I, first of all, I'd just like to endorse um, the, the points that made by my colleagues on the right-hand side there. Um, I do agree with, with what they're saying, um, particularly about the, the fact that our view is that the 2016 
Household projections um, should overall carry less weight than 2014 based projections. I mean, GL Hearn quite helpfully in their, um, their report point out a number of, um, of differences between the projections in terms of how they've been um, compiled between ONS and CLG. Um, the fact, for example, that the 2014 projections were based on the methodology that looks at household formation rates going back to 1971, whereas the latest ONS version, of which, of course, the PPG makes no reference to, um, confines itself to 2001. Um, and there's other points about um, birth rates changing, death rates, and, and so on and so forth with migration. Um, the point being that in my hearing statement in paragraph 2.82, I quote the ONS, where they've published a blog about the new projections, which was dated in October 2018, which cast doubt over whether lower projections actually mean lower housing is, is actually required. And if I can just, just quote you a couple of sentences from that, because I think it's relevant. It states that, although the latest household projections are lower than the previously published projections, this doesn't directly mean that fewer houses are needed in the future than thought. This is because the projections are based on recent actual numbers of households and are not adjusted to take account of where homes have been needed in recent years but have not been available. Therefore, if more homes are built, the increased availability of homes may result in more households forming. But of course, the opposite is also true. If fewer homes are built, then fewer households are able to form. And I think that's particularly relevant for York. Um, I mean, I've put a, a table again in my hearing statement, table two, which compares the rate of net household delivery in York against policy benchmarks. And that shows that even using the council's housing need of, of 790, the RS figures, um, they haven't delivered anywhere near the amount. Going back to 2004 05, um, and in simple terms, they've undelivered by about 3,500 homes over those years. And that's got to have had a knock on effect for people's ability to, to form a household. Now, just, just one or two points, and then I'll finish and let someone else talk. But the revised PPG uses the 2014 projections as the baseline for the standard methodology. And it's very clear as to why they do that. It's to provide stability, it's to ensure that. Uh, historic under-delivery and declining affordability reflected and to be consistent with the government's aim of significantly boosting housing delivery to get this figure of 300,000 nationally. And the PPG is very clear that the 2016 household projections don't provide an appropriate basis for use in a standard methodology. Now having said that, I'm cognizant of the fact we are in a transition arrangements, um, but the 2016 do not align with the government's long-stated aspiration to boost housing. Um, and I believe they should carry reduced weight as a consequence. And at the very least, if the council are to be used, um, the 2016 projections, they've got to apply careful attention to the use of sensitivity testing to reflect the long-standing consequences of housing under delivery. Now, when we, to, we talk about the sensitivity testing later on, um, I just don't believe that the GL Hearn work goes into the amount of depth I would have expected for sensitivity, sensitivity testing, given the clear issues in York. Um, Mr. I don't know if this is going to be for you to reply, Mr. Gunner, but um, do you have the capacity to take some more points before I uh, look to you? Very relaxed and casual. Thank you. Um, Mr. Good. Thank you, sir. Um, I'll try not to, to reiterate points that have already been made, albeit to say... Grateful not, for you'll that. <laughs> you'll note from my hearing statements, we do agree with most of those points anyway. I think just to add a little bit further to, to what has been said already, uh, and if it has been said, apologies if I do reiterate it, but the Council were well aware what the government and where the government was going prior to the publication of the proposed modifications. It was well aware what government had said about the 2016 projections, and whilst we understand that this plan is being dealt with under the transitional arrangements, and the PPG is a material consideration that was relevant to that uh, MPPF at the point in time, it's also a material consideration to consider what government are doing, and to completely ignore more up-to-date government advice in terms of a set of projections, as opposed to how you apply a method to get to your end point, I think is, is unsound. I don't see anywhere within the, the report where they have given sufficient weight to what the government has actually said. And whilst I, we did read the criticisms which you mentioned earlier, those seem to be quite easily passed over by saying, well, if we, if we, if we make slight adjustments for household formation rates, we can get to something which we consider reasonable. Given the, 
the significant impact of the 2016 projections, I don't think that is reasonable. Uh, and for the reasons we set out, we, we actually consider it to be an unsound position. Mr. Keir. Thank you, sir. I, I think, again, um, I won't repeat much of what has been said because uh, uh, I was going to say, uh, raise many of the points that have already been raised. But I think, again, it's important to understand the context and how we've arrived at the use of the transitional arrangements. Um, Mr. Elgin said yesterday that the Council would have been criticised if it hadn't taken account of the 2016 projections. Um, I, I don't agree with that point. I think, as has already been said, the purpose of the transitional arrangements was to allow councils to keep moving forward to deliver the 300,000 dwellings per annum by mid-2020s, which is the government's overall objective. And we have, as already been alluded to, there's been consistent uh, uh, decisions by the councils, at politi political level particularly, over the years to drive the housing number down uh, as, as much as possible. And we've, we've outlined that chronology in our representations. The two examples that we, we've highlighted are the local plan working group in, in uh, July 2017 when officers recommended the, the, the figure that's already been referred to, the 2017 Schma addendum figure of 953, uh, but uh, members rejected that and went for a figure of 867. And more importantly, uh, in, 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 the, in January, 2018 local plan working group uh, where members were advised of their statutory duty to ensure the submission draft plan met the test of soundness and officers uh, offered, uh, they referred to, at, at that point officers had outlined the consequences of the standard method being applied to York resulting in a figure of 1070 and officers offered members the option of uh, increasing the uh, housing allocations to make the plan um, more sound and to essentially uh, align with the direction of travel in national policy to achieve uh, the significant boost in housing uh, delivery. Um, also, sir, the, the many references have already been put to you, but another one in a uh, House of Commons parliamentary briefing paper, 7th of June 2019, uh, the, the, the advice in, in that parliamentary paper was that the, the technical consultation on updates to national planning policy and guidance um, was published in 2018. In it, the government argued that lower household projections did not mean fewer homes were needed, and there should be or, or that there should be changes to, and there should be changes to the standard method to ensure consistency with the objective of building more homes. And that objective has, in, in our view, and as we've set out in our representations, appear to have been lost on the council. I finish by saying that, of course, members are entirely entitled to uh, reach whatever decisions uh, uh, they, they, they want. That is the, the democratic process. But we do need to be aware that in, uh, uh, in, in uh, prioritising protection of the green belt, as certain uh, members have done over the years, let, let me just give you a quote from the leader of the council in 2014, um, count, uh, from a, a, a uh, local press article uh, when the uh, council were looking to review the, the 2013 uh, plan and, and introduce a new plan. The leader of the council at that time was said, we really want to preserve the green belt and we don't have room for more houses. Now, political decisions have consequences and the consequence here is that we argue, and as, of, uh, as others I think argue, that that has driven the council to a a figure, a housing requirement figure, that is unsound. Mr. Clark. Uh, by way of overview, uh, uh, we have made three submissions on, on the local plan all of which are consistent and you've assured us that they will be taken into account. And on top of that, I don't think there's been a single speaker that I haven't agreed with so far, and our submissions don't agree with. I just want to add about three things. <clears throat> you said this is a strategic discussion. Uh, it is not a numbers game. At the start of the plan, it says that your city council's vision is a prosperous city for all and to provide sustainable development. 
the uh, council considered this plan at the beginning and were recommended by officers to provide 1,070 dwellings and we've ended up debating whether 790 should be provided. It is quite clear that a rounded picture has not been considered here and throughout the entire period that we have been considering it, uh, York has been the most unaffordable city in the north of England for housing. And during the last five years, uh, despite the fact that York had the highest unaffordability uh, of any city, uh, the rate of housing price increase has gone up higher than that in the rest of Yorkshire and Humberside. And yet, as Mr Keogh has said, throughout the period, uh, the numbers being proposed have been falling, in flying in the face of the fact why do house prices go up? Because there are more people that want them than can get hold of them. And this doesn't seem to have crossed the City Council's mind. Uh, I have been working with these kind of projections for many years. They are not an exact science. They are one piece of data alongside many others which have to be consider uh, considered. And you have to take a strategic view of what is needed within a city and look at all of the inputs to that and it, I frankly find it astonishing that the council is prepared to continue to, to go against the advice of key parties including its own officers and consultants when it is suffering from the worst affordability crisis for housing in the north of England. To be fair to Mr. Gardner, um, I'll, shall I hear from you now? You, you're, you're still good, eh? <laughs> okay. Um, Councillor Pavlovich. Thank you, sir. Um, to concur with um, many of the speakers, um, and particularly Mr. Keel, um, we do feel that the decisions that have been made um, in, in amending the housing numbers um, do make this unsound. In 2017, the GL Hearn um, report that was um, given to officers at the, uh, from officers to the local plan working group stated the GL Hearn report recommends that based on their assessment of market signals evidence and some recent inspectors' decisions that York should include a 10% market signals adjustment to the 867 figure. This would increase the housing figure to 953 per annum. The market adjustment is based on an assessment of both market signals and affordable housing need. GL Hearn has considered a single adjustment to address both of these issues as they are intrinsically linked. At that same yes, meeting... Uh, uh, for, forgive me, um, Councillor Pavlovich. Um, you, you're referring here, are you, um, to the document, the um, previous OAN work done yes. by GL Hearn that yes. was... Which we felt... Which, which, was, was, me, which, which was submitted... Um, as I recall, um, with a note um, drafted by council officers on it, um, saying that, well, we, well, I, I paraphrase, and you, you'll forgive me for so doing, um, but saying we, we agree with some of what's in here, but we don't agree with the final figure. Is that right? Um, officers also stated in, uh, in January 2018, um, it is, sorry, I'll just... In officers' opinion, an increase in the supply of housing, and that's from the 867 figure, would place the council in a better position for defending the plan proposals through the examination process. So I do feel that officers um, have indicated that the uh, market signals adjustment to the original um, GL Hearn report um, would have been justified. 
yet in uh, that same July the 2017th, and, and, and I'm, I am trying to not make a party political point. Um, uh, yes, you, you um, cannot. No, no, I'm, and I'm, I'm, I don't intend to. Um, but um, a, a motion was then presented um, and accepted that said, and this I think is relevant to the point I made earlier, that the, uh, that the recommendation prepared by GL Hearn in the draft strategic housing assessment assess, uh, strategic housing market assessment to apply a further 10% to the above figure for market signals to 953 dwellings per annum be not accepted on the basis that Hearn's conclusions were speculative and arbitrary, rely too heavy on recent short-term unrepresentative trends and attach little or no weight to the special character and setting of York and other environmental concerns. We feel that that was wrong and we feel that the GL, original GL Hearn report should have been accepted with its full recommendations because it was based on, it was evidentially based. Gardner. Can I, can I uh, just run through the, the points raised so far, if I can, just in summary form, and then we'll take each of those in turn. Uh, we've heard uh, around the room uh, various criticisms. Uh, first of all, that the 2016 uh, projections are unsound. Secondly, the approach using the 2016 base projections uh, has been tested elsewhere, and I think it was, was it Aylesbury or, or, or Wickham that you said and that, that they were rejected there. Uh, third, third point was the 2016 Schma uh, is a more sound basis for planning, and I think that was uh, mentioned just a moment ago again. Uh, the economic need should have been updated uh, at the same time as the uh, demographics basis was updated. Uh, completions have also been low, uh, and that's fed into the lower projections. Uh, by using a number uh, of, uh, based on the old methodology, where uh, the, the, the council is failing to boost the supply of housing, uh, and then finally, uh, our approach doesn't take into account local affordability. Uh, if I can go back to uh, the, the first point, that the 2016 basis is unsound. Uh, as Justin had mentioned earlier, uh, there are two components of those household projections. Uh, the 2016 based population projections, uh, take into, at a national level, take into account ONS's view of what international migration is likely to be going forward, and that is a uh, a view based on their uh, expert panel. Uh, however, other uh, elements of the population projections include mortality rates, which were seen to be uh, on the increase, fertility rates, which were seen to be uh, decreasing, and then life expectancy, uh, for which there was a slowing expectation for life expectancy growth. So it's not to say that life expectancy wasn't expected to improve, it was just expected to improve at a slower rate than the previous versions of the population projections. So uh, it's not just about uh, the, tw the, the, the household projections taking into account a constrained level of growth within younger households, uh, which is the core of the criticisms against the 2016-based household projections. They have to be looked in the round and they have to look at their components. Now, if we were to revert back to the 2014-based projections, yes, you may well be getting uh, a less constrained viewpoint on household formation rates. However, you would be ignoring the latest evidence on migration, fertility, mortality, and life expectancy. My, my, my um, apologies. Um, could you just run that last point past me again? So if you were to revert back to the 2014-based projections, you would be ignoring the latest evidence on uh, international migration, deteriorating mortality, sorry, yeah, so worsening mortality, uh, reductions in fertility as well, 
and these are all based on sound uh, data sets which ONS collect uh, and then also the slowing improvements to life expectancy. Now what the 2016 based household projections do capture is that deterioration within household formation rates. Uh, and that's something that we accept, uh, uh, however, and that's the reason why we have adjusted for them. So we, we recognise that there are these failings of the 2016 based household projections. Uh, however, as set out within our Shema, uh, we have made significant uh, adjustments to uh, the, the housing need number on the basis that uh, if we are to return those household formation rates back to some way between those set out in the 2014 base projections, which is being suggested by uh, people around this table, we've actually gone beyond that and sat, said, well, in actual fact, there's some basis to go to improve household formation rates beyond that to perhaps somewhere to what midway between the 2014 base projections and the 2008 base projections. So uh, it is something that's recognised and it's also something that has been uh, taken account yeah, that, That's something that I was going to pick up on later, Mr McCoggan, but as you, as you mention it um, now, I'll deal with it now. So just, just to be absolutely clear, the, the, the household um, formation rates that you've applied, I, I think you just said, um, takes us somewhere between the levels seen in the 2014-based um, household projections and the 2008 based household projections. Is that, is that right? I'll, I'll pass you to Mr. Mr Gardner for the expert view on this, but essentially yes, but it is only applied to certain age groups. Would you like more information on that? From uh, yes, if I could just interrupt your flow for a moment, Mr McColgan, uh, just, just to um, finish that point. Uh, sorry. The, the point on the household formation rates. <clears throat> uh, well, as, as I think you, you've got you've got spot on. Um, we recognise that those 2016 household projections, because of their two two data points of just the 2001 and 2011 census, were built up over a time when the formation of younger households, which we would typically see as being aged between you know, 25 and 44 had fallen, and therefore there was, there was a clear case to, to go back to um, older projections that, that typically used a longer time series, and therefore looked at 2014. Um, even within those, there had been some criticism about the potential for, for a suppression of household formation, and the last set of projections that arguably didn't contain any suppression were the 2008 figures. So we've built in what we've called a part return to trend where you start to move back towards some of those older figures. Um, and that was an approach that was suggested by the local plans expert group when they, were, when they were trying to look at a standard methodology, not that it was taken forward, but that methodology seemed, seemed, a, reason, it seemed a reasonable balance of dealing with any issues around possible constraints for the formation of younger households. And I think, as, as noted by doing that, you're actually already adding 40% on from the base household projections to a demographic housing need number. Again, without looking up, going from 484 up to 679, I think. So, so clearly making that adjustment, which is, you know, it's, we've heard around the table criticisms of, those project, of the 2016 household projections having that constraint that's clearly dealt with and it makes a substantial difference. While I'm on, just to, if I can just go back, we mustn't forget that the other component is the population projection element. And I think having worked through and, and with my knowledge of how, you know, how the projection is put together um, and, and the way ONS has, has looked at some of the issues, and I think this point, this point around um, the improvements to mortality rates of older people that had been seen in the past and had been projected forward in previous projections had not occurred. And ONS, therefore, while still seeing some improvement in old age 
uh, mortality rates, they were, they were slowed down quite a lot. That actually has quite a substantial impact on estimates of, of housing need, because if, you, if effectively you're, you're killing off older people earlier, there are fewer older people who will form households, and because older people are far more likely to live as single-person households, it does have quite a notable impact on the numbers. So I think, to be, you know, to be very clear, my position is that the population projections that underpin those 2016 household projections are sound. And it doesn't matter how you look at it, they are sound. Um, they, they fit with the trends that ONS is looking at nationally. They recognise so these changes in fertility and mortality. Um, but it is the conversion of those population projections into a household growth that, that we fully accept the points that have been made around the table that, that, that they do contain a degree of suppression and that needs to be dealt with. And furthermore, ONS has recently, sorry, Uh, ONS, I think, in October published a new set of national population projections, and one feature of those is that they have actually seen an even worsening of the improvements of old age mortality. Um, so, at some point in and the I, new I, year, I think you said a worsening. Well, it's, it's, it's a difficult one, isn't it? Yeah. So, the, so mortality is, is still expected to improve. So, life expectancy will still go up, but not at the same sort of rates that we'd previously seen. Um, and that's been gradually coming down from the 2014, 2016 and 2018 projections. And so in due course that will filter through into a new set of local, local population projections. Which I think, you know, we're not, we're not here suggesting that actually the 2016 population projections overstate population growth in York. Because perhaps mortality is not going to be as, as, you know, as good as those projections say. But it's just another thing to, to consider that ONS's further research is actually suggesting that there are further changes that would potentially push uh, elements of population growth down further. But I think, uh, you know, just, just to, to summarise it in very clear terms, two elements to the projections, population, household. We would consider the population is sound, the household growth side is not, and we have dealt with that within that housing need update of January 2019. Can I make one small point that's, un that's rather unrelated? Um, Mr. Robinson mentioned his analysis of completions uh, within his matter statement, which is, he's got his table two, um, and the data has been taken from CLG's live tables one, two, two. The data in that is, is incorrect. Um, we've got, there's been a lot of, I mean, it might be better for the council to speak about this, about this, but there's been a lot of correspondence between the council and CLG about that data. Uh, the correct data can actually be found in the council's monitoring reports, which uh, would be EXCYC slash three. Not, not making a big point of this, but it's just noting that the suggestion was there's been a massive under delivery of housing. Well, actually, there has been some under delivery against that 790 figure, but it's, it's, it's far more modest than is suggested within that Litchfield's matter statement. And CLG have accepted that as well. And, and CLG have accepted that, that their figures are wrong, but they are not, they're not prepared to backdate and change them. So they will remain on the website as they are. Good. <laughs> doesn't help, does it? I don't recall having seen that. Maybe that's something that I've missed somewhere. Uh, Rachel Masefield, just to explain it to you, the, the last couple of years are accurate. We've had a, a, a discussion with the statistics department at MHCLG, and once they publish them, they will not amend them, apparently, although they accept that the, uh, the figures <laughs> may be incorrect. Yeah, if I can just explain, um, this is a discrepancy with the house inflow um, forms that are submitted to MHCLG. Sorry, it's the um, discrepancy with the HFR, the housing flow re reconciliation 
um, return to MHCLG. So the um, data for the last two years, 2017, 18 and 18, 19, is correct and it's consistent with the Council's authority monitoring data that's published on the website um, and is published in EXCYC3, which was the monitoring return for 1718, which includes uh, net completion figures um, over the previous 10 years. Um, the data previous to 1718 was gathered and submitted by the building control team at the council, and the housing stock um, figures were gained from internal building control completions and external um, private inspector records and there was a lag time um, in receipt of the data and the, uh, the figures don't, um, they're not consistent with our own completions data which we gather through our own monitoring that we do every six months. We go out to all the extant consents, planning consents and, and um, accurately look at net completions and that's what we published in our monitoring data. So we raise this with MHCLG and their statisticians, although we've now got correct data for the last two years, they won't um, allow us to um, correct data over the previous eight years because it's a, it's a relatively long data set and they don't want to um, correct. So th this relates to a period of eight years? Sorry, yes, um, it's going back um, prior to 2017-18. Some of the years, the differences are smaller, but on, on, on a number of the years, um, the difference is, is, is more substantial. Um, I can provide a table that compares the two, if that, if, if that would be useful. Uh, yeah, I think it would be. Um, if, I, if I could um, have that, please, that would be helpful. We interrupted you, Mr. McCogan. That's quite all right. Uh, so the, I think that largely rounds off uh, the points about the 2016 base projections. I think, as Justin mentioned, 2018 based national population projections uh, show a lower level of growth, uh, and those uh, at a national level wouldn't be affected by such things as like housing delivery, for example. Uh, one of the other points was that the 2016 base projections uh, had been uh, had been tested elsewhere, uh, and, and that the inspectors had, at, at that local examination, suggested that they weren't fit for purpose. Now, in our experience, where we have sought to defend the use of the 2016 base projections as part of the transitional arrangements. Uh, that was in Guildford, uh, and that was uh, accepted uh, readily that the, under the transitional arrangements there, uh, and I'm sure, sure you've seen the inspector's uh, report in Guildford, but if not, I can direct you to it. Um, well, um, uh, yeah. yes, I, I do make it my business to read um, every single uh, local plan examination report that ever gets issued. Well, in which case, gets I'm, me off to sleep I'm, at I'm night, sure you'll Mr. be familiar. McCullen. I'm sure you'll be familiar with uh, paragraph 25, which goes into some detail about the use of the 2016 based household projections. Uh, uh, I remember it well. And it concludes that the, the, the approach uh, by the council there was sound. Uh, there are other points around the table that instead of using the most recent uh, information uh, or, or assessment of housing need, the 2016 uh, SHMA was actually a more sound basis for planning. Uh, we agree that the 2016 based uh, assessment of need was a sound basis of planning at that time. Uh, we haven't changed the methodology at all since that time. Uh, what we have done is introduced more recent data and that's the core reason why we see the numbers going down from one, one iteration of our report to the other. Uh, it was also questioned about the economic-led growth and I, I appreciate I'm jumping about here so if you wanted me to uh, respond to these issues as they arise or whether you wanted to uh, dictate it through your questions, I'm happy to do either. Okay, so uh, in terms of the 2016 base projections, within our latest, sorry, in terms of the uh, economic growth, uh, our report uh, in 
2018. Uh, it wasn't to test uh, economic uh, projections, the latest economic projections. It was to ensure that the economic growth that the local authority uh, was planning for, uh, there was a, a, an alignment with that and that, to ensure that there was enough homes that, their that the council's economic strategy uh, would be achieved. Now, uh, we heard that we have <coughs> Uh, ignored more recent evidence to suggest that there is a, a need for more jobs or, 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 or that uh, jobs growth would be higher than the 650 used within our OEN calculations. Uh, the, the Council have responded to this within their uh, response to the MIQs, uh, but principally uh, the more recent data which, be, which is being referred to is from 2016. Uh, and those are uh, the regional econometric models. Now, th they were really just used as a sensitivity to the 650 figure uh, set out in the previous employment land review. Uh, the Council accepts that they do have uh, show a higher level of jobs growth. However, when that jobs growth is unpicked at a, s a sectoral level, uh, they would question the validity uh, of of those figures, uh, principally because a lot of the growth in this, uh, and, and, and I appreciate that this might get slightly political, in this uh, austerity world, uh, albeit that that may be coming to an end uh, very shortly, was that the public administration uh, growth and public sector growth was uh, driving the growth uh, within uh, York uh, and, and the reality was that that wasn't the case. Uh, in principle, there was some employment, uh, significant employment growth within the public administration and defence uh, sectors, which the, the council did not uh, believe it was likely to happen any time soon, uh, and therefore rejected uh, those projections. Now, moving on to the hot off the press uh, X. EXCYC29, which was the uh, Oxford Economics Report, uh, which the Council added last night. Um, yeah, um, heads up, um, I haven't had the opportunity to look through that. That's fine. Uh, if you have a copy with you in front of you, the Council aren't relying on this. All they're doing is to ratify that the 650 is a reasonable uh, assessment of future housing growth. Yeah. Now, Can I just make that a bit? put that a little bit more accurately. We are putting it in as evidence, but we're not using it as a justification for making any further changes. So, uh, if I can direct you, I mean, the, the purpose of this, uh, as stated, is we're trying to uh, show that the 650 per annum figure is reasonable uh, and that other alternative assessments uh, of economic growth are unreasonable or uh, not on a sound basis. Uh, if we take you to the uh, cash your eyes to page 21 and the bottom two paragraphs of that document. If you'll bear with me a moment. Um, no, but I'd, I'd late your paperless, uh, your paperless uh, initiative. Uh, at my, yes, at my wonderful attempt at going paper light. Um, well, it's well, very no, small, actually, so I'm, it won't I'm, be that heavy. I, I'm, I'm genuinely, genuinely excited at, at the prospect of reading a document off my screen here for pretty much the first time ever during a local plan examination. So, I'm um, sorry, this is page, what, 26, is it? 21. It's page 21. 21, but on a PDF that might be slightly different. So, you look, look for the 21 at the bottom of the page rather than the electronic version.
So uh, I have that now. Okay. What, what it says is, is to compare the employment results with the shorter forecast period used in the 2015 outputs, we can first look at the years 2019 to 31. The reprofile growth scenario uh, results show an increase in 660 jobs on average per year over the period uh, compared to 610 in the baseline <laughs> forecast. So what Oxford Economics are saying here is that they are uh, reprofile sectoral growth scenario, which is the exact equivalent scenario to the 650 jobs per annum figure, uh, over the 2019 to 2031 period actually show uh, jobs growth of 660 jobs per annum. So uh, a slight increase, but I wouldn't say that it was a, a particularly material uh, input uh, or material change. And what I would uh, Furthermore, if we look at a slightly different and slightly longer forecast period, because of slower growth further into the future, uh, and if you flip over the page to the, the top of the next page, uh, you're seeing that the increase actually slows to around 510 jobs per annum. So uh, what that really shows is that even with the newest data, uh, there, there doesn't seem to be a material shift away from the 650 jobs per annum target which, to which the OEN is based. So uh, I think the, 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 the council are comfortable maintaining that 650 number, uh, and therefore that would suggest that the OEN uh, of 790 uh, on our calculations is sound. Uh, the next point which was raised uh, was in relation to whether uh, the number of 790 jobs per annum uh, is not meeting the government's stated target uh, to boost the supply of housing. Uh, we would refute that, uh, notwithstanding uh, what was just mentioned a moment ago about the MHCLG data. Uh, and, and, and other parties around the room who actually show that uh, there is a, potentially a lower rate of completions. We are saying there hasn't been a lower rate of completions. In actual fact, what completions uh, have been over uh, the period since uh, the 2012, completions have, have on average 686 dwellings per annum. Sorry, say that figure again. 686. Yes. That's correct. Yes. We have, uh, as we say out, there is a housing need for 790 uh, per annum over that period. However, when you include the uh, unmet needs since the start of the plan period, then the, there is a residual need of 822 dwellings per annum. That, uh, and the council are seeking to achieve that for the remainder of the plan period, and that would be an almost 20% <coughs> higher than historic, un, uh, historic delivery. Uh, and we would maintain that that would be uh, a significant boost to housing delivery in the local context. Now, uh, the final point, and again, stop me if you will, because it's a little bit off topic, is that uh, the, the local authority aren't taking account of local affordability issues. It was uh, suggested to us that York has the highest, afford uh, highest levels of inaffordability uh, in the north. Uh, that's not something that we are disputing at this time. Uh, however, what the guidance suggests that we do is to increase the housing need from the starting point on the basis of those market signals, uh, of which affordability is one of those things. Uh, we have, uh, as set out within the various documents, we consider that the economic uplift uh, would entail an improvement to affordability, an improvement to market signals. And although we haven't specifically made uh, I specifically made a market signals adjustment. Because of the increase on the basis of economic growth, we consider that that encompasses part of that uh, market signals adjustment as well.
And again, at your uh, nighttime reading of the Guildford uh, Inspector's Plan, uh, sorry, Inspector's Report, would uh, <coughs> would confirm that uh, Mr. Bohr there would uh, agree with that assertion. So can I make what you may think is a tedious lawyer's point, though I hope it's none the worse for that. Uh, sorry, a tedious point by a lawyer as opposed to a tedious, well, you pay your money and you take your choice. <laughs> um, I thought for a moment you were going to say a point by a tedious lawyer, Mr. Alvin, but you didn't. No, that's, uh, yes, well, I realised my grammar was pointing in that direction. <laughs> um, yes, please. It, 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 it's just this. A lot was made of, um, well, government has moved uh, to different projections, not the 2016 look at the House of Commons briefing paper, look at what's been said. Of course, the important point, as Mr Austin Fell accepted uh, in making his points, that they relate to the new standard method. The House of Commons briefing paper is not planning policy. It is an explanation to members of the House of Commons by a single person explaining the changes in planning policy. And it makes it clear, if it's read fairly, that it's looking at the changes between what are currently the transitional arrangements and the new standard method. The fact is the government hasn't even settled on the standard method yet, of the final version of it, as we know only too well. And the requirement uh, under the transitional provisions to use the older guidance, um, whether or not that was based on an initial view about expediency or not, remains national policy guidance. And of course, we are required under the Act and under the, the framework itself to uh, operate in accordance with that transitional policy guidance. Notwithstanding everything that was said about, well, what has been said about the projections in the context of the new standard method, it remains national policy that transitional plans operate under the transitional arrangements. And subject to making appropriate amendments, as have been explained to you, to take account of material changes, there is no justification, nor can there be, for doing what is essentially being urged on you by a lot of parties, which is effectively to junk the 2016 projections and to use uh, other projections, which themselves are a choice of expediency and policy, which have not been applied to transitional plans. MHCLG knows only too well what the issues are, as you know, uh, as between um, the transitional provisions and the new standard method, and yet it has chosen not to change the transitional arrangements for plans such as the York Local Plan. It's therefore applying the statutory test in section 19 and the soundness requirements in paragraph 182 of the framework it's not open to the parties sensibly to contend. You should just junk the transitional arrangements and the requirement to look at the latest projections. Providing sensible adjustments are made, and they have been explained to you by GL Hearn, then in uh, our, our submission, it's entirely right to take the starting point which accords with national policy, not what parties seeking to drive up the numbers find most expedient. Thank you. Mr. Barnes. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, could I ask, because um, we went on to market signals there, are we coming back to that later? <laughs> um, yes, my, my carefully laid plans have slightly frayed yeah. um, around the edges, uh, which does tend to happen. Um, <sighs> Yeah, we'll come back to that later. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure, should I forget it, you'll, 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 you'll remind me. <laughs> um, just um, on two points. Um, first is the use of the 2016 projections. I think the council's entitled to consider that evidence, given what PPG says, but at the same time picking up on what Mr Natkus earlier, earlier said about having consistent basis across the board for your objectively assessed needs evidence. Um, We've heard that until yesterday there wasn't up-to-date employment evidence in the plan, but there's also no up-to-date um, affordable housing evidence in support of this plan either. Um, it relies on a uh, 
the affordable housing need which is found in the Schma uh, 2016 which from my readings based on 2012 projections, forgive me I don't know if it's population or household, um, and also reflects a uh, modelling of 2015 based uh, low quartile affordability ratio which has since increased massively in the Arctic. I think it's now on 2019, I think it's another 30 grand on top of where it was in 2015. Uh, the other point on um, the transitional arrangements, I think it, well, have, having been at examinations elsewhere, I, I was at the Mansfield plan examination um, where that plan was submitted in the, tran or before the 2019 MPPF applies and the inspector there found that their use of standard method was perfectly reasonable given the direction of travel in national planning policy. Even though there, the standard method resulted in a reduction in housing needs compared to the... In, in um, Mansfield's case, Mr Barnes, that, um, that, that, that's one that I'm not familiar with. Um, what was the standard method being proactively used by the council? Yes. Um, is that because the housing numbers were lower? <laughs> I can't comment on that. Um, it was, uh, so we haven't had an inspector's report on that. We've only had interim findings which say that, she, that the inspector there, uh, Sarah Housden, is happy with the assessment that they've done and the approach taken. Um, there they are applying a small uplift to the standard method projection um, on account of economic growth. It's only something like 20 a year. Um, but the, the uh, evidence produced under the 2012 framework in that case is much higher. Mr. Mr. Butler. Thank you, sir. I'm trying to circumnavigate other people's points, so I'm going to try and pick up on a, a specific one in reference to um, the housing monitoring data. Um, so referencing document EXCYC3, 2017-18 monitoring report, and specifically the first paragraph uh, and then table six. So it's just, just to say that I don't think we should get too excited about housing delivery in the last three years in the city. 69.4% of that which is 900 of the 1,296 was from student accommodation and conversions. So it's not really delivering the needs of the city, so a scarcity of affordable housing. And if you refer then to table six, that then confirms that that's the same pattern over that three year period, which is why the numbers jump from circa 580, I think. Sorry, I'm just scrolling down. Yeah, we jump from 507, up to the 1296 in the last year, and that's a, a pattern um, that we've seen, and obviously it's a, a massive issue in terms of delivering on needs. Thank you. Mrs. Cook. Thank you very much, sir. Um, can I just go back a step, begin by just going back a step and uh, r reminding um, you that Although, as you have been at pains to say, we are looking at the MPPF in 2012, that MPF in Annex 1213 told planning authorities to get on and produce plans that reflected that guidance. Secondly, can I remind you that at SDO 41, you'll find the letter of intervention from the Secretary of State on the 23rd of March 2018, because six years on, York hadn't got on. And it was only thanks to the intervention of Sajid Javid when he was the Secretary of State that pushed York into submitting a plan. By the time that happened, the public consultation on what became MPPF2 was out, but government was making it perfectly plain in that document 
and again, you've got this at SDO 43A, page 26, that they were committed to the 300,000 per annum figure. And, and in my submission, that's important. And it's one of the reasons why in Nuneaton and Bedford, Pool and Wire, the examination inspectors have been content to continue to allow councils to use 2014 uh, based projections because those projections are the closest thing to achieving government's still current 300,000 per annum target. That is, uh, uh, and just, uh, just again to add some context, when the transitional provisions were introduced, which was first in July 2018, as you will uh, know, with MP the second uh, MPPF, it was done in the context and it was designed to incentivise councils to continue plan making. I don't believe anybody envisaged in 2018 when they introduced the transitional provision that we would find ourselves with an examination in the back end of 2019 using the MPPF 2012. This is pretty unprecedented and will be, I suggest, the last time most of us around the room look at the MPPF 12 and the 2015 IDA 2A. Even you, sir, with your uh, <laughs> uh, work workload. So, what seems to be happening I'm not, not, is... Not, so, I don't think I'd be quite so sure. <laughs> <laughs> what seems to be happening is that the transitional provisions are being used as a pretext to ditch the original 2014 household uh, and population-based projections and those original schmars. And, and I suggest that that is really the antithesis of the positive planning and the achievement of the 300,000 that the government is still committed to. And those other inspectors in everywhere, it seems, but Guildford, were, were right it's, to continue to allow councils under the uh, transitional uh, provisions to use the 2014-based um, projections. Now, I quite accept, as you've already pointed out, that playing the rules according to the 2012 MPPF, we have to play the rules according to the IDA to March 2015. And I quite accept the starting point uh, in paragraph 15, which you've already uh, referred to. But it's equally uh, relevant to point out that in the next paragraph, th there is clear advice that every time new projections are issued, it doesn't render the old projections out of date. And moving on a paragraph, and I think this is really critical here, plan makers should be considering sensitivity testing specific to their local circumstances based on alternative assumptions in relation to the underlying demographic projections and household formulation rates. And when GL Hearn told you about the factors that you would be ignoring if you fail to have regard to the 2016 figures, they were looking at the national picture. They didn't take you to anything that was York specific. So sensitivity testing is crucial, and it hasn't been done here. And at the risk of, there are several points that are, are, are particularly telling, I suggest, in relation to local factors. One of those points is to actually ask yourself, what has been 
going on on the ground in York in terms of growth. And can I take you to our matter three, sorry, our matter two paper, I'm getting ahead of myself, paragraph 3.24 and 3.25, where we explain that what's been going on in, in York recently is that household growth and population growth have been at their highest rates when compared to earlier decades. And housing completions. Can I take you to EXCYC3? I don't think I'm in danger of being told those figures are wrong. The housing monitoring report, just taking the last three years, and I'm looking at table six in that document, the last three years, 1,121, 997, 1,296. That averages out at 790. Sorry, that averages out at 1,169, which is 32% less than the 790. So they've actually been achieving in the last few years a lot more, although I accept that those figures appear to have been boosted in relation to students, and I'm, I'm coming on to students in a moment. In my submission, Guildford ap appears at, at face value to be the outlier. But actually, when you look at Guildford, and I... I don't, un I don't understand Guildford to be um, on your examination um, documentation, but um, at my submission, you are, you are going to have to look at the detail of this. You will see that there was a 79% uplift applied to the starting figure in Guildford as a result of Guildford-specific issues including, by the way, students. And that the ultimate figure was, in fact, a match for the standard methodology, which is a curious and happy coincidence, perhaps. But it's not one that's enjoyed here. The economic forecasting is another thing that I want to draw to your attention, if I may. So you have at SDO 63 the September 2017 ELR. They looked at several scenarios and in putting into this was the economic development strategy, which is your SDO 70. That economic strategy was covering the period 2016 to 2020. That looked at two scenarios. I'm just going to start with the economic strategy, if I may. Scenario one was keep going, we're doing fine. Scenario two, choose a better story, be more ambitious. And the economic strategy chose scenario two to be more ambitious. They chose the better story. And what seems to be happening is that the local plan is not matching the ambitions of the economic strategy. And it's a little curious, and perhaps I've, I'm just a little paranoid, but it's a little curious that the economic strategy for 2020 to 2024, which was promised in December, hasn't yet appeared. But I fancy that's not going to be doing, uh, that's not going to be a, a, as doer uh, a, a, a pessim as pessimistic as the council would have you believe. There are 5,000 jobs predicted to come out of the central York development. That's just the jobs being provided at that development. 
those jobs rise if you start to take into account to, to over 6,000, if you start to take into account the additional jobs that will be generated just from the, from the uh, development, the, the additionality factor. The University of York, we heard yesterday, is, I think, one of the two largest employers, Mr. Elvin told us in his opening. And although they're not here today, they have provided you with a paper on matter three. And in that matter three paper, they suggest that the council's employment land allocations for them, uh, and I need to take you, so it's, Yes, in their matter three paper, they are suggesting that they will only have enough, enough land to accommodate university growth to 2023. So you've got, and, and again, just to give you some context, they are currently employing just under 5,000 people. So... According to one of the biggest employers, there's not enough land in the plan to accommodate their growth throughout the plan. And there's a mismatch between, in, in terms of jobs, let me give you another interesting, um, and I say very valid, and I hope helpful reference. One of the points that we make is that the council relied on one economic forecast. That's from one economic forecasting house, i.e. OE. And to test, to sensitivity test this figure of 650, we've looked at recent, recent job creation in the period 20 to 11 to 2017, looking at three measures each published by ONS. So we've looked at the job density figures, the BREZ figures, and the APS figures. And they are giving us an actual average of job creation of 794, averaging out those three sources of data. That's a 0.7% increase per annum. And again, there is a mismatch between what has been happening on the ground, the better strategy, which the council has plainly been achieving, and this completely unambitious 650 figure. And if that figure is allowed to go unchecked, what, what, what will it mean? It will mean, ultimately, more people getting pushed out of York and therefore more people commuting. And that's not envisaged and being planned for, so there's no mitigation measures being put in place. So, the sensitivity testing needs to be done properly, and it needs to, there needs to be a sense check. And I suggest that the figures I've just given you demonstrate that there is a mismatch between what's been achieved in the last few years and what they are now planning for. And on a, on a little point of detail, the OE, because... We were one of the people saying that the OE forecasting wasn't um, up to date. And the latest, sorry, I'm awash with paper. Can I invite you to go back to your screen for a moment, sir, and, and just get out that document. And I'd like to take you to page 19, please, and figure 13.
So, so sir, figure 13 is giving you, first of all, the old forecast of 620 based on the what they call the 2015 output is their 2015 forecast. And actually, the figure to compare with that, looking at the same period, because they were looking at 2014 to 2031, is 680. So it's 620 plays 680. And I happen to notice that Barton Wilmore, in their submissions, referred to an updated OE figure, and it's 680. And that's the source of it, I suspect. So I think it's a little apples and pears to compare the figure on page 21. There seemed to be a suggestion that on page 21, what, what's being looked at there is a reprofiled growth scenario. Now, it's a shame in a way that figure 13 didn't have an added column on the right-hand side headed scenario two, because that was the preferred scenario in, in the employment land review from 2017 that, that, that I referred you to. Um, and if it had, but if there had been this extra column, the 620 from the 2015 would have risen to 650. That's the source of the 650. And I suggest to you, sir, that actually the, the, in this imaginary right-hand column, scenario two, the figure in the bottom right would be 660. So that this, this wouldn't be showing um, a reduction. It would be showing a moderate increase. But I, I, I'm asking you really to... Um, do this sensitivity uh, check and to look at those three data sources and using those three data sources conclude that the economic uh, forecasting is simply not ambitious enough. And I'm also suggesting that in the particular case that we are dealing with, given it's only the 2014 projections that marry up with the government's ambitions in terms of boosting significantly, which is what the MPP, MPPF 2012 tells us to do, you should be using the 2014 uh, figures as your starting point and, and then making adjustments. Thank you for your patience, sir. Uh, thank you, um, Mrs. Cook. Um, I'm going to take um, a short adjournment now and make it 11.02. Um, I'll adjourn the hearing to resume in this room at 11.20. Thank you. Thank you.